Now let's pray. Father, we ask humbly, with gratitude, Lord Jesus, that by your Spirit you are in our midst this morning, at work in our hearts and lives, and with gratitude that your word is truth, and that, Father God, you're here, you are our Father, and you're worthy of our worship, that as we seek your face now through the pages of Scripture, Spirit of the living God, be our teacher, be the one to strengthen, encourage, and challenge us. Uh, continue your gracious, patient, committed work in our lives to continually reproduce the character of Jesus in us. And we thank you in faith for the way some of that's going to be accomplished in the moments that are before us. We continue to seek your face through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few years ago, a guy by the name of Samuel Porter came up with an idea to make some quick cash. And his plan was pretty simple. He'd walk into a grocery store in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with a counterfeit bill and hand that counterfeit bill to the cashier and ask for change. And if it all worked according to plan, he'd leave the funny money behind, and of course the cashier would give him the change, and he'd walk out of the store with a whole bunch of real money. But the plan didn't go exactly as Sammy had hoped. Upon entering the grocery store, going up to the cashier and handing the bogus bill, well, the cashier immediately identified it as a counterfeit, called the manager, called the authorities. So what went wrong? Maybe it had something to do with the fact that Mr. Porter, in going into the grocery store, didn't take with him a counterfeit $50 bill or even a counterfeit $100 bill. No, in the true spirit of go big or go home, he went in there with a counterfeit $1 million bill. <laughs> it raised suspicion. <clears throat> at least a couple of things immediately come to mind. I can't imagine any cashier at any grocery store actually having that amount of money in that cash drawer to make change on a $1 million bill. And uh, in addition to that, of course, there's no such thing as a $1 million bill, nor has there ever been. So... Uh, Sammy didn't leave the store that day with any real money, but he did get to leave with some members of the Pittsburgh Police Department. This morning's scripture passage, as we near the end of our Got Truth study in 2 Peter, is all about counterfeits. But not counterfeit money, counterfeit profits. If we were to encounter in our lives, in our households, in our faith community, a counterfeit profit, would that individual be as evident to us as was that million-dollar phony bill to the cashier at the grocery store? To the end that we would be able to discern the counterfeit prophet and as followers of the Lord Jesus proclaim the real Jesus and his true and unchanging gospel, in this scripture passage, the Apostle Peter provides us with some important insight for identifying the phony. The passage is 2 Peter 2, verses 10 to 22. If you're using one of the church Bibles, it's on page 854. Here's the first principle then for identifying the counterfeit prophet, the person who purports to speak for God but doesn't speak for God at all. Peter says this person is going to be marked by a prideful attitude. Attitude really matters, and it certainly does when it comes to someone who suggests that they are a messenger for God. In those early churches that Peter was desperately concerned for, there were counterfeit prophets that had wormed their way into the fellowships, and these people were marked by prideful attitudes, just incredible arrogance. Let's pick it up with verse 10. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they, the counterfeit prophets, are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they're stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. This third, uh, pardon me, this second chapter of Second Peter contains some of the hardest hitting discourses in all of the New Testament on the grave danger posed by pseudo-prophets or by counterfeit prophets. And so the Apostle Peter 
deeply concerned about it and moved by God the Holy Spirit actually devotes then one-third of this brief three-chapter letter to that very subject of identifying the counterfeit prophet. And in the verses, Peter straight up says that the counterfeits that were imperiling the early churches, they were marked by an incredible pride-filled arrogance. They were presumptuous. They were a law unto themselves. They refused to come under authority. Not only that, they despised authority. And as an example of the arrogance that characterized these counterfeit prophets, Peter would say of those individuals that imperiled the lives of the early church, these individuals didn't even think twice about slandering celestial beings, as he described them. It's a way for Peter to describe the entities in the demonic world. They didn't even bring an appropriate respect against the kingdom of darkness and the evil one. Contrasting that would be the contest between the archangel Michael and the enemy that's described in Jude verse 9. So the archangel Michael and the devil were in this battle. And God's word tells us that the archangel Michael had enough respect for the enemy that he wouldn't bring a slanderous accusation or word against the devil, but would only rebuke the devil in the Lord's name. Peter was saying against that are these counterfeit prophets who are so full of themselves and so filled with arrogance that they don't even think twice about going where angels would never dare to go. They just spewed nothing but arrogance in the things that they would teach as purportedly reflecting the truth of God. Their attitude was so over-the-top arrogant. That strikingly contrasts the character of humility that's to mark the true messenger of God. Every couple of months, for 23 bucks, I get a haircut and about 20 minutes of fascinating conversation. It's because my barber is from Iraq. So uh, recently, I was paying a visit to him, last month in fact, and he knows what I do vocationally, and we have great conversations around God and faith communities and stuff like that, and so he's from Baghdad, and so uh, last time I was there, I said, you know the family of churches that I'm a part of, the Christian Missionary Alliance, like there's an alliance church in Baghdad, I was really curious to him. Uh, what do they do, he wanted to know. So we talked a little bit about what the church in Baghdad would do. And meanwhile, I pulled my phone out of my pocket. And I'm calling up a Google map because I'm looking up the Alliance Church in Baghdad. And I show it to him. And he's looking at it. And he's very curious. And a smile crept across his face because he said, oh, that uh, back in the day, that was a very beautiful part of the city. <clears throat> and my father used to have a restaurant not too far from where that church is. Then he stopped clipping for a moment, and uh, he looked at me and he said, if your leaders told you to go to Baghdad, would you go? And the question just arrested me. I mean, it just grabbed my heart so deeply in that moment, and I found myself just really, really pondering that. Because at some level, I knew instinctively what the right answer was, but I was really processing that for a moment. And I finally came around to say to him, you know, if my leaders asked me to consider going to Baghdad, and my wife and I prayed about it, and collectively we believe that God wanted us to do that, I would like to think that in submission to the Lord Jesus, in obedience to him, I would be willing to do whatever it was that God asked me to do. Friends, if God were to ask you to do something, go to Baghdad or reach across the street to one of your neighbors that's from Baghdad, would we be willing to do that? The hallmark of the true messenger of God, and that's all of us. Because every follower of Jesus gets to be on mission with Jesus. Amen? One of the hallmarks of the true messenger of God is a humility of spirit where we submit, first of all, to the Lord Jesus to the degree that we would say, I'll do what you want me to do, and I will go where you want me to go. That is to be the spirit that characterizes the true messenger of God. Jesus would even say, you want to be great in God's kingdom? That's a noble thing to aspire to. This is how you become great in the kingdom of God, by being the servant of all, by being submitted to the Lord Jesus such that you're an other's first kind of person. That's the mark of the true messenger of God. These counterfeit messengers in Peter's day and in our day are characterized by something so different than that. They wouldn't think of being in submission to an authority, for they are 
and authority unto themselves. They were marked by incredible arrogance. And where we see that in someone who claims to be teaching the truth of God, where there's not a humility of spirit reflective of the heart and character of the Lord Jesus, alarm bells begin to go off for us. Here's a second characteristic then of the counterfeit prophet. Peter says these individuals are marked by depraved activities. There were some individuals, as implied in this scripture passage, who'd actually wormed their way into the fellowships. They were a part of various faith communities, and they were living their lives in some unbelievably awful ways. Verse 13. <clears throat> they will be paid back with harm for the harm they've done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight, their blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts in greed, an accursed brood. They've left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. There are a handful of words there that we need to take a little closer look at, and the first would be the word feast in verse 13. That was the original church potluck. In the early church, the followers of Jesus would regularly gather together. They'd share in a potluck supper together, and following that, they would share in communion in the Lord's Supper. So do you see what Peter is saying? He's acknowledging in these verses that counterfeit prophets were in those churches, or at least some of them, and they were at the feast. They're participating in that meal. That was their Sunday practice, and then come Monday, these same counterfeit prophets would shamelessly and brazenly and openly live in all kinds of evil and sinfulness. That's what they were known for. And then the counterfeit prophets would come back next Sunday to the feast and to connection with the body of Christ. It seems apparent that someone in leadership here has dropped a football a little bit for those individuals should have been called up short. <clears throat> that was not happening and Peter was deeply concerned. Not only that, as Peter notes, when these people were a part of the body of Christ, were they there to seek the face of God? No. For those counterfeit prophets, they were scoping out the body of Christ, looking for a potentially vulnerable individual that they could then come alongside, seduce, and entice into their kind of evil practices. So a devastating thing that was going on in the early churches. Peter was deeply concerned about it. And that's again why he takes one-third of this letter to pour his heart about it. Peter goes so far as to describe these individuals and what they were doing in the early church as blots and blemishes. But not only were they marked by that kind of arrogance and this immoral activity, Peter says there were experts in greed. That's another word that's worth focusing on for us. Experts in greed in verse 14, <clears throat> the word experts comes from a term that gives us our English word gymnasium. And what do you do at the gym? You go to the gym to work out. You train. Peter is saying that those counterfeit prophets in some of those early churches in the Roman province of Asia Minor, they actually were training, working hard at getting good at being bad. They were experts in ripping people off, in manipulating others in order to line their own pockets. Peter describes them as following in the path of this curious Old Testament prophet Balaam in their pursuit of the wages of wickedness. So who is this Balaam guy that Peter refers to here? Balaam's story is recorded in Numbers chapter 22 to 24. And Balaam was a curious guy. <clears throat> One day, the king of Moab came to Balaam. And he was troubled because he was tired of the Israelis handing their butts to them every time the Moabites and the Israelis got in a dust-up. Because he had to figure it out. The God of the Hebrews is stronger than the God of Moab. So the king went to Balaam and said, hey, would you do this for us? And I think it'll help us out the next time we get in a fight 
with the Hebrews. Would you put a curse on the Israeli people? And Balaam said, well, I'm going to have to ask God if it's okay if I put a curse on his people. I mean, it just seems like a prayer you wouldn't really have to make to God. But curiously, God sort of engaged Balaam, kind of played ball with him on this one. And in time, God even told Balaam to go back and talk to the king of Moab. That's because God knew that through the actions that were about to unfold in the life of Balaam, his deceptive heart would be overwhelmingly revealed. So on the appointed day, Balaam hopped on his donkey, and he goes down the path <clears throat> to go and meet the king of Moab. But along the way, on three occasions, the angel of the Lord stood in front of the donkey and stopped it up. So the donkey would stop or leave the path. On each occasion, Balaam lost it and beat the donkey. Finally, after the third such occasion, God supernaturally enabled the donkey to talk. And in essence, the donkey said to the prophet, what is wrong with you? What are you thinking? And in that moment, Balaam, while he previously could not see the angel of the Lord, now could. And he got down on his face before God. But in that moment, it was painfully obvious that here was a prophet who had been willing to prostitute his prophetic office for making a quick buck. That was the wages of wickedness. And Peter reaches back to his Old Testament history and says, these prophets, pseudo-prophets, counterfeit prophets in the churches are operating at the exact same level. They don't have anyone's good in mind. They're after their own greed and seeking to line their pockets by manipulating other people. It's quite a litany <clears throat> of depraved activities that the Apostle Peter describes here that these pseudo-prophets were involved in. <clears throat> Billy Graham once said that when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. Those counterfeit prophets had absolutely nothing to offer. They'd lost everything by virtue of the fact that they were people of zero character. Contrasting that, of course, is the true messenger of God. And we get to be those people as followers of Jesus. For the true messenger of God, we want our lives to be marked by integrity. We're people of character. We live in yieldedness to the Spirit of God, such that the character of Christ is continually conformed into our lives. And as people of integrity, as people of character, who seek to live what we say we believe, who seek to follow in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God in Jesus' ways, and call others to do the same, God works through us to make an impact and a difference in our world. But not so those counterfeit prophets. They were people of very dubious character at best. Well, here's the third thing that we see about the counterfeit prophets. Peter in verses 17 to 19 talks about their empty announcements. Filled with arrogance and with very dubious character. They would spew their deceptions which at best were absolutely empty, and at worst, their words were truly destructive. Notice how Peter describes it in verse 17. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For the mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So Peter in these verses actually unpackages the message of the false teachers. And he would say these people, and again, they're claiming to speak for God, the blessings of God in the lives of people. When in reality what they're doing is they offer life but deliver death instead. And he gives the analogy of an oasis that purports to offer life to the weary desert traveler only when they come upon the oasis. It's just a dry creek bed. There's nothing of life to offer there. The false teachers would offer life, but in the end, they deliver death instead. They, the, they would uh, suggest that they were there to offer pleasure. 
But in the end, all they did is offer more pain. Those false teachers there were telling people that you can have God, you can follow God, and you can live as immorally as you want to live. You can just live your life any way that you want. I mean, what a lie and deceptive message. Totally not the truth. <clears throat> and hope and encouragement is found in walking in Jesus' ways. That's where freedom is, not in doing it our way, but that's not the message that the counterfeit prophets conveyed. What they said was, you can have it all and you can have God too, you can live however you want, but it was a message that in the lives of people just compounded their pain and their brokenness. And they also said, I've got a message of freedom, but instead their message produced nothing but bondage. So four years ago, the very last soldier from the Second World War to surrender passed away. And the fellow's name was Hiro Onoda. So uh, the Second World War concluded in 1945, of course, but this soldier remained at his post for the following 29 years on a small South Pacific island. Evidently, they knew that he was out there because they sent search parties to go and find him and to tell him that the war was over, he could come home. But he assumed that the search parties were enemy scouts, and so he hid. And they flew over the island, and they dropped leaflets down on him to let him know that the war was over. You can come home. And he assumed that it was nothing but enemy propaganda. So one day, an individual took it upon himself to actually visit this South Pacific island to look for this soldier. And in time, he found him, and he handed to the soldier a letter which was written by his commanding officer. And Hiro read that letter, and in it he said he was commanded to come home because the war was over. In fact, by then, it had been over for nearly 30 years, and the soldier was now in his 50s. But he did at that point get to go home. He went back to Japan. I think of that, and then I'm reminded of Something that happened 2,000 years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, he stepped onto the battlefield and through his death and resurrection, he won the victory. When we choose to yield our lives to Jesus alone as the one who could forgive and lead us, we find freedom from sin and shame and freedom from bondage, and freedom to live in joy and in peace and in strength and in victory. That's the true message that the true messenger of God brings, as opposed to the deceptive, destructive messages of the evil one. <clears throat> as those who are blessed to be on mission with the Lord Jesus, that's the good news of the gospel that's been commended to us to convey. Well, finally, in the last three verses, 20 to 22, Peter makes what really is a tragic acknowledgement these counterfeit prophets were 100% that counterfeit. They didn't even know the Lord Jesus, and unless they repented and turned back to God, their lives were eternally imperiled. Notice how he writes it, beginning with verse 20. <clears throat> if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord, and if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, and are overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its own vomit and a sow, is, a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. So this was Peter's evaluation of the actual level of spirituality that characterized those counterfeit prophets. And what he's saying to us is that these individuals professed faith, but they didn't really possess faith. At some point in their lives, they'd heard the truth of God, they'd heard the truth of the gospel, and they'd pondered it for a minute, but rather than truly yielding their lives in faith to Christ, they walked it back. They walked away from the truth. And in so doing, Peter said, while they were worse off for having done that than if they'd never heard the truth at all to begin with. In other words, it's always a serious thing to come under the truth of God's word and walk away ignoring it. That's what these individuals had done. Presumably, they'd had some kind of a warm, fuzzy spiritual moment where maybe some aspect of God's truth even provoked them a little bit, and they embraced a period of personal reformation where they said, I'm just going to try harder tomorrow, and next week I won't do that. But they did not 
yield their lives in faith to Jesus such that they experienced Holy Spirit transformation. So they were counterfeits in every way. They weren't genuine followers of Christ. And then to drive home this argument, this tragic acknowledgement that Peter makes, he used a couple of analogies. He talks about the pig and the dog. He says you wash a pig up and set that pig back in the yard, and what are they going to do? They're going to run for the mud. And what about the dog? A few weeks ago, our uh, pretty little Jade Grace, three years old, was with us, and as we learned after the fact, Jade Grace had been feeding our miniature dash on gummy bears. At some point, as the weekend unfolded, said dog got rid of the gummy bear. And you know the crazy thing about a dog? And it's a gross analogy that Peter gets, but it's really intentional on his part. The dog pukes up what is in their belly, and then what do they do? They step back, look at it, and say, cool, warm meal. That's the way dogs operate. It's a gross analogy, but Peter makes a profound point. The pig and the dog, they do what they do because that's their nature. The counterfeit prophets did the evil, gross, and disgusting things that they did because that was their nature. They'd never been transformed by the Spirit of God. They're just following after who they were. And it was something they needed to think seriously about, get right with God. Or they were in grave danger, not just for this life, but for the life to come. Meanwhile, friends, we who have been privy to the grace of God in Christ Jesus and our lives have been transformed by his gospel. We're the real deal. God by his spirit is indwelling us. It's all God's goodness and mercy to us. It's nothing that we've done or deserved. But God has done this for us and we bring the living Christ who is indwelling us by his spirit and every people contact that we will have through the rest of this day and into tomorrow. And in that way, we get to be God's true messengers, sharing this hope and this love of Jesus that's within us, with others. Well, Mark Twain once said that a lie will go halfway around the world before the truth even puts its boots on. <clears throat> that is the destructive power of deception. So how do we take care of ourselves? How do we keep our heads up and guard our households? Three thoughts in conclusion. Let's make sure that we're in the faith. Those false teachers were living a powerful, personal delusion. They were counterfeits. They didn't actually know God. Let's make sure that we're in the faith, that we've come to a place in our lives whereby we, an act of our wills, we've made a decision to yield our lives in faith to Jesus as the only one who could rescue us from our sins. If you've not done that or you're not sure that you have, today is the day. Simply pronounce your yes to the Lord Jesus. Tell him that you believe that he is who he says he is. God's son who died and rose to set you free. Make sure you're in the faith. Then let's make sure we're growing in the faith. As we engage the truth of God's word more and more and more, as we ingest it, as we take it in, as we ask God's spirit to use the unchanging truth of God's word to shape and mold our lives, <clears throat> By contrast, that which is an error becomes so incredibly obvious. The more we're familiar with that which is true and right, the easier we will spot the counterfeit and that which does not stack up to the truth of God's word. And finally, let's make sure we're sharing our faith with others in the body of Christ. When God does something in our lives, he teaches us the truth. We come into an understanding. The Spirit helps us to grow as a way of stewarding the body of Christ and shepherding our brothers and sisters. Let's also share one with another that God's truth might, as we disciple each other, build strength into our lives so that we may stand in victory in a world in which there's lots of deception. Let's pray. Father God, in your mercy, by your Holy Spirit, in these moments, I would humbly ask for that which you'd have us to grab a hold of each of us at an individual level, that even in these moments, <clears throat> you would just speak that deeply into our hearts, your strength, your encouragement. Thank you that our confidence is in you. Um, help us to own what you would have us do as we conclude, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.